there. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all again. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces. I appreciate that you come back. Um, the rest of you joining us for the first time, welcome. We also have remote viewers with us today. Amy Layton right here, our program coordinator for Work Life, is going to be um, orchestrating those folks. So we welcome them as well. My name is Diane Braddock. I'm the Work Life Consultant for Human Resources. And between Amy and I and Deb and Kathy, we are really pleased to be able to present to you the third session of the Aging Well series. Um, our work office provides programs, consultation, and referral services for faculty, staff, retirees, students with dependents on a variety of different issues. This seemed to be one of our highest priorities, and we're really um, thrilled that we could offer it this summer, and we hope to be offer um, other similar types of sessions throughout the year. So a few housekeeping things, be sure and sign in if you haven't already. Restrooms are out the door and to the right of the atrium. Um, we'll be sending out an electronic evaluation after the event to get your feedback. And we'd appreciate if there are certain topics that you have interest in, be sure and let us know what those are. So today is Envisioning Retirement and Realizing a Meaningful Retirement. This is a session that uh, happened at Lifelong. Um, and it was fabulously attended and um, we really appreciated both the research and the expertise and um, the perspectives that these two ladies bring to us. So after many years of um, decades of planning for retirement, this is the one area of retirement that doesn't get a lot of focus, the social emotional kind of preparation. Oftentimes the part of retirement that gets a lot of focus is the money issues and um, so on, but this is a, a really good perspective, a, a unique, different way of uh, moving forward. So Kathy and Deb, we welcome you and we'll take it from there. So first question is, yeah. would you rather have us standing or sitting? Or sitting? Can you see us? Yeah. Not standing. really. Okay, standing. Yeah. Stand, we show. <laughs> yeah, then you can see us better. Well, I retired twice. I did the classic Cornell retirement where I officially retired and then came back to work for six months in December of 2015 after over 30, about 33 years, whoops. 33 years, yep, Amy's gonna keep keep me <laughs> on. About, about 33 years working in the library. So I worked in Mann Library, the Agriculture and Life Sciences Library. And for the last 20 years of that period, I was a mid-level manager and I maxed out at supervising a group of about 25 people. So my, what I'm bringing to the program that Deb and I do is experience with that supervision and also experience with research and finding information. All right, thank you, yeah. thank you very much. And I'm Deb Schmidley. Um, I first came to Cornell in 1978 <laughs> and I sort of winked in and out a couple of times um, but like Kathy I've been in the library system off and on for almost 40 years and I re first retired also like Kathy I did two retirements I first retired in 2013 I think yeah 2013 um, and then 10 months later got sucked back in working with Kathy actually on, on a, this grant funded project so also like Kathy, I've had a lot of experience with management uh, and leadership. So I've done a lot with staff, um, helping them set their career goals, um, doing things like change management, helping people through that process. So Kathy and I kind of got together after we both retired and started talking about uh, how retirement felt for us and also just talking about you know what are what are the sort of challenges because as diane said a lot of us plan for the financial future but we don't plan for the personal what's going on uh, after we retire um, so what we're going to discuss today basically is i'm going to actually move over here i guess we'll move over to the podium um i don't know if i can get this guy up here or i'll just hold him, I guess. all right so what we're going to discuss today is basically how to identify and achieve, or maybe adjust, your non-financial retirement goals. And as part of that, uh, we'll talk about how you can examine your personal values as they relate to retirement, and how to possibly uh, identify and maybe repurpose your existing skill set if you would like to volunteer after retirement or like we did, get another part-time job after retirement. So things to think about like that. A lot of times people don't really know how to repurpose their skill set. Also, we wanna talk about how you can develop a flexible plan that's going to meet your changing needs and interests in retirement. 
because what our goal is today might not be what our goal is a year from now. And also we know that uh, we wanna be flexible because unexpected life events come up, things happen. So we'll talk about how as you plan your retirement goals, how you keep those kind of flexible. Now, uh, how many of you attended the last program or the, uh, any of the two programs? Okay, so this, might, this one might seem like a little bit of an outlier when we're talking about aging in the community, but I think as you'll see as we go on today that it really does fit rather well with the other two. Kathy and I are gonna be covering all the issues that we just discussed, but we're also gonna be asking you some questions because we really wanna make this an interactive session. We don't just wanna stand up here and talk to you. We wanna hear what you're thinking. We wanna get your ideas. So we're gonna to try to make this um, as interactive as possible. Okay, so, oops, how do we get over here? There, there we go. Um, all right, so we already talked about who we are, so you know, you know who we are. Um, as part of this process, when we started talking about putting together this kind of program, one of the things we talked about was, you know, we'd like to hear from other people. We know what our perspective is, but we want to hear from other people. So we ended up surveying a number of academic colleagues across various different fields. And we collect, and they were retired. So we collected data from them and we, you know, wanted to hear from them. And we said, so, you know, how far in advance did you plan your retirement? What did you want to do in retirement? What did you think retirement was going to look like? And now that you're retired, what's the reality? What do you wish maybe you had known about before you retired? What were you surprised by anything? And we took all of the data from um, that survey and used that as kind of our starting point for this presentation. All right, so you know who we are. This is who we are not. <laughs> We are not financial planners or bankers, or, and we're not gonna talk about finances. Um, we're also not medical advocates or advisors, so we're not gonna get into that part of retirement. And even though we're talking about that, the kind of change of going through retirement and the emotional process and the personal feelings, um, we're not psychologists or, or social workers. We're just retired librarians who are really good at research. <laughs> so we're not, we're not gonna get into that realm quite as much. Um, and then in terms of our focus audience, um, you guys are actually the perfect focus audience because we said, okay, who do we want to kind of gear this, this presentation to? And we said, well, we wanna find people who are two to five years out from retiring, or maybe people who are recently retired, or really anybody who just wants some information on you know, how to do these kinds of things and just get some background on that. So um, that's uh, our focus audience. And we also say, you know, whether you've been retired for five minutes, five years, or 20 years, it's never too late to still be thinking about how you wanna move forward, how you wanna plan, what you wanna do. So this is not something that has to happen before you retire. Okay, so why do you need to plan for the personal side of your retirement? You know, as you already, as we already heard, we all plan financially and we know why we have to plan financially. We still have to pay our bills after that paycheck stops. We have to pay for our health care. But what, you know, what's the big deal about planning personally? I mean, you're retired, right? It's yippee, I'm no longer working, I'm happy, I'm free. Well, retirement really does signal a big change in our lives. It's a, it's a big life event change. And it signals that we're, if nothing else, it signals we're growing older. And for some people, that's kind of a hard pill to swallow. Even though you want to retire, you're like, yikes, you know, suddenly, suddenly I'm getting older. And it's a transition. And it can be a transition that we look forward to, or it can be a transition that maybe we're a little ambivalent about. It's, it's, you know, it could be a scary transition. And really, when we're talking about change, all change means letting go of something to move towards something else. And in the case of retirement, uh, you know, what are we letting go of? Well, we're letting go of our jobs, right? We're letting go of our paycheck, even though we're not talking about finances today. We're letting go of our personal identity. A lot of us really personally identify with the jobs we do. We've been working all our lives. And, you know, so we identify with what we're doing. We're letting go of a routine. We were used to getting up in the morning, dressing in a certain way, going to the office, you know, seeing people. That whole routine has changed. So it's letting go of a lot. And that loss of identity in particular, uh, we both heard from, you know, we, we heard this from the people we surveyed, that loss of identity in particular is a lot harder than people think it's going to be sometimes. 
a lot of people think it's going to be a breeze. And then when suddenly you're not that person anymore, you're not identified by your job, then it's, it's a little difficult. We also know that, you know, change is stressful, even if it's good change, even if it's something you're looking forward to. So if you think about maybe when you got married or had children or bought a new house or started a new job or moved to a new city, all of these things could be really exciting and you were looking, you know, you're looking forward to them. They're all positive things, but they also had a lot of stress, you know, they go, they went along with them. So all of this is very important when you think about transitioning into retirement and what you want to do personally. Also, not all change is planned. You know, some people, those of you who have been around long enough, remember in 2008 when Cornell was going through their uh, budget crisis, some people took early retirement, some people were, had to take early retirement, so maybe they weren't planning on retirement. So sometimes the decision's made for you. It's not a change plan you decided to make yourself. But the, the real thing to remember here is what I just said before too, is whether you're retired or not, whether you're getting ready to retire, whether it was planned for you or not, we should all be moving towards something positive and meaningful as we move into this next section of our lives. All right, so who hasn't retired yet here? Okay, good, all right. Um, and who has retired? Good, the equal, sort of an equal spread, okay. So for those of you who have not yet retired yet, and you can just shout this out, what word, if we play like a word association thing here, if when you hear the word retirement, what comes to your mind? Which, which one? Freedom. 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 Okay, freedom. Another one? Not setting an alarm. Yeah, we all like that. <laughs> Sleeping in, right? You can sleep in. Yes. End of income stream. Yeah, that's a big one. Anybody else? Travel, doing what you want, if you know what it is, and that's what's important. That's what we're actually talking about today. Exactly. Yeah, anybody else? Okay, so those, those are all pretty common things. Now, for those of you who have retired, when you were getting ready to go into retirement, what did you think? Did you have those, did those same words pop into your head? Uh, did you have other thoughts about retirement? And now that you're retired, do those, do those expectations match what you're doing now? Does anyone want to, anyone brave enough to want to? <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. But you're bouncing. Great. Okay. So one one person here said that uh, she wanted to do volunteer work when she retired. She did volunteer a couple of times, and now she's looking for even a third volunteer opportunity. So that's fantastic. Anybody else? Anything surprise you? Yes. I love the fact that you didn't have to set the alarm and what a good night with eight hours sleep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so she looked forward to having an eight hour sleep and she got it. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's very important. Yes. I am both retired and not retired because mm -hmm. I left my job abruptly after three years of being in Southern Mm hmm. Uh, but I always have Ah, of course. Because yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, and I wanted them to know that there was another side to my personalities and intellect. Um I didn't have any trouble with them not giving up with them. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. But mm -hmm. I actually got very depressed when I when I gave away my work clothes. It's um, that's a big change. So so yeah. Um so Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. But that, you know, over the last year or year and a half, I've found that I have a different kind of power. I'm in this other phase, and it's been really enjoyable. It's healthier for me. And I, uh, I stopped saying what I used to be. Uh, and, I, and I just have to know where I am. 
That's really well, wonderful. We should take her on the road with us. <laughs> I want to repeat, Kathy. Nice way of it too. Who else experienced that feeling of loss of power? Anybody else? Yeah. yeah so okay. So I just want to recap for the people who are listening, coming in remotely. Um, so if you do abruptly have to leave a job for whatever reason, and this woman actually had something else lined up, uh, something different, but there is a real sense of loss of power and loss of identity, exactly what you're saying. And that, that concept of when people see us, um, and this is an age thing too, you know, when people see us when you're younger, again, you identify with who you are. When you start getting the gray hair, when you start looking older, people have a different mental picture of who you are. They're surprised if they hear you do belly dancing or they hear that you were an astrophysicist or they, you know, because now they just see you as we think anyway, they feel like it feels like they're seeing us as older people. And you've got this whole history and this whole background and this whole knowledge base that they're not seeing because you're not, like you said, giving away the, the work clothes. It's your uniform in a sense, you know, it, it identifies who you are. So yeah, that loss of power is really big really big. Thank you. Anybody else want to? Okay, Kathy, I think you're up. So we've, kind of, you. we've kind of, oops, oh yeah, I haven't been remembered to do all this. Um, it's an interesting thing, and I'm going to go back to Deb's talking about change, because what we've talked about just now is some of the things you stepped away from but also some of the things you're stepping into. I remember the first day waking up and realizing every day is a weekend day now. And that was something amazing, but I will tell you a small anecdote. On the weekends when I worked, sometimes I would let myself have a beer at lunch and a glass of wine at dinner. And then I realized when every day is a weekend, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to be better about that. All right, now let's see if I'm gonna get the slide to, whoops, where are we? Oh, yeah, I need to get, no, I need to get way back, way, yeah, well, I don't know what we, whoops, no, I'm going the wrong way, <laughs> Gloriaski, where, yeah, that's it, all right, how am I going to get back to the slideshow, I know, yeah, oops, sorry, I'm not stepping on your foot, here, go yeah. down here, yeah, let's, And I uh, worked with computers. <laughs> <laughs> this is how this much is I walked away from Disney. There, that's what I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what So from current slide, right? Yeah. So yeah. hit this guy. There you go. Ta-da! <laughs> when we last left ourselves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Glasses and the <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know we, we've sort of said, all right, you you're looking at making that step into retirement, or you have made that step into retirement, and you're at that stage where you're starting to think, all right, if I'm lucky, or if you are lucky, the financial part is looking pretty good. You've made that decision, and you're not too worried about that. So it's good that you're paying attention to the other side of this, the emotional side or the soft side of this. And we're going to start talking about now the sort of process that Deb and I worked through based on our experience working as supervisors. And this is a quote from Roy Disney, who is Walt's brother. And he was, I think, the financial manager for much of the Disney enterprise. And it really does encapsulate what we think is the start of a process for this emotional side is identifying your values because if they're clear like if you have children I, I don't but I know that parents who have children once they have the children a lot of decisions become very easy because those children are the core value and they're front and center so once you have values and they're clear to you making some decisions about what I want to do and how do I want to do it becomes easier and our work experience taught us to break it into three parts. The first is identifying the values. And then the second is identifying the goals that emerge from those values. And then the third is kind of the fun part, the activities that help you achieve those goals. So it's an approach that helps you focus on the important things 
And it also reduces the chances that you're going to look back with regrets 10 years from now. I wish I had done this or I wish I did that. And if you're thinking about these in a deliberate fashion as you move through your retirement, uh, I heard one person refer to it as their third act. As you move through that, then maybe you're reducing the chances that you're going to look back with regret. So as you're moving through the change, not that kind change. Um, it helps then to look at those kinds of values. Now, which one of these do I, I think I have to hit. I hit, yeah, hit M. We do hit M. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So in your, in your handout, we've actually got a sort of a worksheet and that you don't need to do it now because that might distract you. But this slide has some values that are commonly talked about in retirement or actually as you're living your life. And page one of your handout is a structured way to help you identify the values that might be most important to you. So when you go home or if you want to start it now, if you, you know, we get boring, you could start writing these things out. But start writing out values that are important to you and write them till you fill up the page, not in any order, just as they come to you. Then once you've got that page, step back and choose the 10 out of those that are more important than the others. So you can do it by choosing the important ones or crossing off the ones that aren't as important. And then once you've done that, take one more step back and look at that list of 10 and choose the three out of those 10 that are the most important. And this is a way of focusing in and forcing you to think about this. Um, in a way that, that really focuses in on what your core values may be. And ultimately, the process of choosing those values is more useful than the actual list you might end up assembling at this point in time. It's that idea of saying, today, when I make this list, these are my values, these are my higher values, these are my really core values. In another 10 years, it could be something completely different because life just keeps coming at you and your values are gonna change based on that. But this process then gives you a way to put into words the things that are important to you. Um, and if you're not a verbal person, you could do other ways, use it as emotions or some other way of expressing your values. And another way of ident identifying your values is actually to look at your own actions. When you lose track of time, what might you be doing? Is it a, are you singing? Are you gardening? Are you playing with the uh, children or your dog? When you're smiling or singing to yourself, what are you doing? When you step back from something with a real sense of pride, what is it that you are doing? So if you think about those actions, see if there's a correspondence between those and some of your values or if they help you express your values a little bit better. So does playing with your grandchild make you lose track of time? Family might be a very high value for you. And if purpose, having a, a feeling of purpose for what you're doing is a high value, you're probably proud when you walk away from a shift at the local food bank. And as I said before, this process should be continual. This is not something that you set and forget. This is something that you return to. Um, I come back to it probably about every year go back and think, how are these things working? This process should involve other people, your family, your significant other. Return to your values, return to what Oprah Winfrey once called your passions as your time passes and to see what's changed. Other things may have come up that are much funner than what you were doing before. I think of it like a garden. I tend to use metaphors a lot, but a garden flourishes when you pay attention to it. You weed things out, you move plants around, you bring new plants in your life changes. The big shade tree just starts taking over from your neighbor's yard. So you start putting hostas in that section. It's that sort of thing that it's a continual <laughs> process that you're, you're going through. So as I was talking with this, were there any values that kind of immediately popped into your head that you thought, I'm going to put this on my list, or maybe you already did? Particular values, anybody wants to share? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So family is one, but it's it's. Family was yeah. Lord. Yeah. And then So after family and the security are starting to be less important, the joy and the current and being in the moment. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see a lot more of myself in okay. Not that I want everything, but just that I'm trying to get see little things, even things that are bound to mm -hmm. joy that, you know, a smile on my face, but I need to see it. I need to see it. But it's good. And you know it when, you, when you're experiencing it, so that kind of yeah. smile on your face. Yeah. That's a definitely good value. Yes. Health, yes. And the things that you need to do to, to do that. Other values. So just think about those. And, you know, you don't have to go home and make the list all at once. That can be something you just kind of return to and you start building that list. Okay. So now we're going to come to the second part of the process. The achieved slide forwarding which is building your goals list. So you've got your values or you're going to identify those. And there are many online lists of suggestions to get you started. And our resources page at the end of the handout will get you those. Um, and actually, did we put the Facebook? Well, we didn't put it on the handout. I think it's on our business card that we've left there. We're back. We have a Facebook page where we are um, actually posting some articles yeah that's on our business so you may already also have identified some goals with health I'm going to do this or I want to do that and the thing to do is to add in what you have identified about your values to see do they kind of support or align with the goals that I have or how do I if I want to create my goals list, work from the values. The slide lists some obvious clusters, you know, the one that those of you who came to earlier sessions, the idea of aging in place. I'm doing a round of home improvements to keep my place in, in place. Physical well-being is definitely something that happens or have, occurs on a lot of people's goals list. I got back in the lap pool after 40 years and discovered, by golly, it's like riding a bicycle. You can if you knew how to do it, you can still go and swim. People uh, doing creative activities. So people who are musicians or played on the weekends or uh, dancing or painting, back to my gardening. Definitely volunteering comes up for a lot of people. And that's volunteering both at the local level, at the food bank or the Red Cross or whatever, or international, traveling places and helping build a school somewhere. Another very common one is the exploration and travel. And that's uh, definitely on my list and definitely on Deb's list. When we try and coordinate our calendars to meet, we can see, we find two weeks here and then a month goes by and another two weeks. Um, I had one um, professor who had gone to every state capital except Hawaii and Alaska. And that was how he organized his travel. And some people are now going to national parks, trying to do that same thing. And there was actually a Google map where somebody mapped out the shortest route to go to all the national parks in the, in the contiguous states. Um, and does everybody know about the, the senior pass for the parks? All right, you can get the pass and then you can go in for the rest of your life with that senior's pass. So then um, you've got your values identified you're starting to fill out a goals list and what you want to do. 
then you get to do the fun part, which is doing things, the actual activities. And the idea is to be deliberate about your planning and thinking so that that doing flows as part of this process. And that's again, reducing the I wish or the feeling of floundering or that day you wake up and you go, what am I going to spend my day doing? However, the caveat is we're not saying you have to organize your life by the minute, by the day for the next five years so that you know exactly what you're going to be doing on April 2020. This is a way to focus your activities and to give it a little bit of a deliberate feeling, not just drifting. Some people, like Deb, embrace the Encore career concept. So there's a coherence to their post-retirement activities. The other people, I'm an example of the other type, I call myself a putterer and a dabbler. I like to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and on any given day, you know, it could be anything across several of the different hobbies that I have. So the first step in this fun part is identifying what you might need to, to uh, um, accomplish your goals. So in order to paint a room, you need a can of paint, you need a paintbrush, I need lots of masking tape. You need that, those sorts of basic things. And it, it pays to take a moment to identify the skills and the tools that you're going to need to achieve the goals that you're setting out for yourself. One of the common things is repurposing your existing skill set. We've done that in a way in doing the research and identifying articles and resources useful to people who want to plan a thoughtful, meaningful retirement. And the skill set doesn't need to be attached to your job, your, your, your second act. Um, look across the full spectrum of your life and identify all the skills and interests that you might have. So one way to do it is think about the past month. What did you do? Or think about how other people might describe you. If they were to, to say, oh, so-and-so, she's a natural organizer. He's a born negotiator. Those are the sorts of skills that, that you can be bringing to your third act. So you're looking at both the skills you've gotten from your job, which is what Deb and I did, and also from your non-work activities. Do you like cooking? Are you a good cook? Do you like family care? Not just your grandchildren, but you just like little babies and you want to take care of them. Do you have a hobby? that you want to amplify or turn into something more, more um, serious. And I'm going to go here so I can see my prayer hand in the way. Um, so yeah, so again, this has a change component to it, right? So as I said earlier, it's often difficult for people to assess their own skill set at a very broad level, not connected to the specific job they were doing. So two examples that I can give from my own personal experience, like Kathy said, I'm kind of in an encore. I'm not very good at retiring. <laughs> I, don't, I don't stay retired very long. I get too bored, I guess. But um, so when I retired from Cornell the first time, I had been director of research and learning services at Cornell. So I did have a leadership and management experience. Um, but I had also taught as an adjunct um, lecturer, both at Cornell and at the University at Albany, and I had done other teaching, and I always loved teaching. In fact, when I was a kid, I thought that's what I was gonna be, was a teacher. So when I retired, um, I knew I wanted to do something else. So for the past few years, I've been working for a company in California, teaching online, I'm teaching management and leadership courses online. Um, it is teaching to librarians and people in publishing, so I'm still in that sense connected to that library thread somehow, but really, it's, it's not, I'm not in a library, I'm not teaching, you know, that kind of thing. So I used those skills and I repurposed them. And going out even a little bit further than that, uh, decades ago, I had been a reference librarian um, before I became a manager, before I went into management. And I always loved that kind of face-to-face -face interaction with people and talking to people and trying to help them and trying to do the research, as Kathy said, you know, we were both natural researchers. So um, my other sideline is a volunteer activity, but I realized when I was teaching online, I really liked it, I was passionate about it, I was enjoying it, but something was missing. And I had to kind of go back to that values that, that Kathy was talking about again and say, okay, what's missing? What, you love to teach, what's missing here? And what was missing was I missed the face-to-face. -face. I missed getting out of the house instead of just sitting in front of my computer teaching because the students didn't come to me in real time. I put the stuff up. I would interact with them, but they could come in and out through the course of the week, each week. So I was missing the face-to-face -face interaction with people and really helping people. So last year, 
I became a volunteer um, down at Lifelong for, to do Medicare and Medicaid counseling. And that was a big shift for me because on the one hand, I was repurposing my skill set in knowing how to do research and liking being around people and helping people. I knew nothing about the healthcare industry. I knew nothing about Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, you had to go through a very rigorous state training program and then you had to be certified and every year you're recertified. So that was an example where I'm using my existing skill set in doing research and in helping people and doing that one-on-one, -on -one, almost kind of reference type of help, but I'm not, I'm not volunteering at the Tompkins County Public Library. I'm volunteering in a totally different area. So that's just another example of how you can kind of repurpose the skill set that you have. Or you could go an entirely different direction. You know, maybe you want to volunteer or do something else. It has nothing to do with your skill set. Maybe you want to learn a new skill or, or, you know, start something else. So you can also do that. There's, there's no right or wrong to how you do this. The audience has spoken. We will stand. <laughs> so I'm an example of that second. Um, the, the total extent of my repurposing my existing skill set is doing some research for this and every once in a while helping a friend research um, something online about the census or something. So I'm feeding the passion I always had for art, but um, never really took up seriously. And I took up making mosaics, chipping little pieces of glass and gluing them into to frames from Michael's or whatever. And also the, the challenging one is I'm trying to learn how to paint watercolors and that's that's going to be a lifelong continual failure, but sort of a happy <laughs> continual failure. So there's a sheet in your handout that's going to help you work through this sort of skills identification section and then decide which ones you actually enjoy doing um, and you might want to use in your retirement activities because I'm a decent cook and I like to cook, but just for myself. I wouldn't want to go to a shelter and cook for a lot of other people. So it's something where you don't have to use your skills. You can learn new ones, like me trying to learn watercolors. And I'm gonna bounce back. We're doing this tandem yep. thing. Yep. Tag team. Yep, tag okay. team. All right, so yeah, and as I said, there's no right or wrong approach to this, so don't stress about it. You know, it's just it's whatever feels good to you. That's what's important. Okay. So, um, and, I, and actually, I'll also say as an aside, Kathy's being very modest. She's a very good watercolorist, and her, and her mosaics are fantastic. Uh, as someone who can't draw a straight line with a ruler, I really, I really respect that. Um, okay, so now let's talk about goal attainment itself. So in the beginning of the session, you know, I said that this course was a little bit, this session was a little bit of an outlier from the other two that you may have attended. Um, but really it is relevant when we're talking about the overall topic of aging in the community. Because in addition to helping us kind of plan ahead, setting goals actually helps you stay very mentally stimulated. It keeps you stimulated as you're thinking and planning ahead. And if your goal turns out to be that maybe you want to volunteer or you want to travel or take a class, then you're also getting that social engagement piece. You're staying very socially engaged in your retirement. And finally, like Kathy was saying, going back to the laps, you know, doing laps in the pool, if, you're, if you set a goal to exercise more, which most of us always say we're going to do, I'm also failing at that goal along with my <laughs> retirement goal, but I'm trying. Um, if you're doing that, uh, you start you join a gym, you've got more time to exercise now, it's keeping you physically fit. So if you're thinking about aging in the community and staying in your home longer or whatever, your long, your long range goal, that might not be pertinent right now today, but in your long range goal, those three components, you know, staying physically fit, staying mentally alert, um, staying socially connected, all of those things are absolutely vital to help you stay in place, age in place. Um, and also it's been proven that all three of those things also help stave off things like dementia and Alzheimer's. So the very fact that you're doing that kind of work does help you age in place, basically. Okay, so once you've identified your values and your passions and you've begun to articulate your goals doing doing the work in that workbook you need to start thinking about how you're going to attain your goals and this goes back to what kathy said about really being deliberate in what you're thinking about how are you going to do this how do you deliberately do this um, 
I'm going to talk about SMART goals, which is something that it's, it's a process that many of you might be familiar with. It's basically a management approach to setting and achieving your goals, but it can also be applicable here outside of the workplace. So to go through each of these in turn, each of these acronyms, so S stands for specific. So when you retire and you say, okay, I want to volunteer. I know that after I retire, I want to volunteer. Well, you have to be, you have to ask yourself specifically, um, well, what kind of volunteer work do I want to do? Do I want to work with the public, which is what I did because I like working with the public, or maybe you don't want to deal with anybody. Maybe you say, you know, I want to be behind the scenes. I'll do data entry or I'll do something else. So you want to be specific about what it means when you say I want to volunteer. Also, how many hours a week or how many, you know, how much do you want to volunteer? You want to throw yourself into a 40 hour a week position where suddenly uh, you do have to get up with the alarm clock and you can't sleep in? Or are you saying, you know, I want to volunteer, but really I've got lots of other priorities. I only want to volunteer about 10 hours a week. So you want to be specific when you're setting that goal. What, what exactly do you want to do? Measurable, um, this is actually how you track your achievements. And this is pretty easy in retirement. I mean, if your goal is to volunteer uh, someplace and you've, you've matched that, you got, you got your volunteer position, you're doing as many hours a week as you want to do, well, then it's easy to measure that one, right? Or if you want to read more books, you can start keeping track, you can join a book club or start keeping track. It's easy to measure. But the reason I bring it up here is because when we measure our goals, when we actually deliberately say, okay, I'm going to measure and see if I really hit these goals, it helps us stay on track to actually meeting that goal. And it makes you really feel good when you've done it. You know, when you've, when you've aced, when you found that volunteer position you really want and you're doing what you want, then you say, yeah, I met my goal. And that's, that's actually very affirming. Attainment is about, or being a, a, attainable is about um, really being realistic. So lots of times people will set New Year's resolutions, which are kind of like goals sometimes. And you know, you'll hear someone say on January 1st, I'm gonna lose 35 pounds by March 1st. Well, unless you're on a really unhealthy diet, that's probably not a very realistic goal. And what happens there is the opposite of what happens with a measurable. You know, when you meet your goal, you feel good, you've done it, you're, you're energized about it. If you don't attain your goal, if it's, if, it's not, if it's not realistic and you miss that goal, then you get very discouraged and you say, oh, heck, forget it. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to lose weight anymore. I'm, I'm discouraged, I didn't meet my goal. So it is important to be realistic about what you're shooting for. And relevant, this is not as timely outside of the workplace because honestly, if it's your interest and if it's your passion, then it's relevant. It's gonna be relevant regardless. Um, but that said, the relevant kind of ties back to the specific. So if your goal again, let's, let's use the example of the volunteering. If your goal is to volunteer, um, then you wanna find relevant, not only how many hours you wanna volunteer, but like I said, you know, do you wanna work in the public? Do you wanna work with kids? Do you wanna be behind the scenes? You want it to be meaningful for you. You don't want to just say, it's, it's, all, it's great, you know, if you say, well, I just want to give back to the community, I want to volunteer. But if you end up maybe, um, I don't know, stocking shelves in the soup kitchen, maybe you really feel good about that because you know in some way you're helping the soup kitchen. But if it's not your passion and you're like, well, I'm doing it, you know, I'm giving back, but really this, I'm not interested in this, that's not going to, if it's not relevant for you, it's not going to be as rewarding. So you want to be relevant. Um, and timely is the last one. This is just timing your goals at the right time to meet your needs. Um, so, you know, if you say, well, I'm going to retire and I want to uh, renovate my house and then I'm going to move south and I want to do this all in 18 months. Uh, and this is actually a good example for that whole acronym there, because first of all, you want to be specific about this. So when you say you're gonna renovate your house, are you just renovating your bathroom? You're gonna gut the entire house? Are you gonna do it? Is somebody else gonna do it? So you have to plan that. Um, how are you gonna measure your achievements? Again, you've got 18 months. So at what point are you gonna say, by this point, I want the house renovated. By this point, I want to have contacted the realtor wherever I'm moving. By this point, I want to have closed on my house, that kind of thing. Is it realistic? Is it attainable? Uh, if you're doing this in 18 months and you're gutting the entire house and you're doing all the work yourself, is that realistic? Can you really do that in 18 months? Is that going to happen? And then finally, relevant. So you say, okay, I'm sick of the south. I'm sick of the north. I'm sick of the snow. I'm moving south. Well, where? Southeast? Southwest? Where do you want to be? 
do you want to be in a in a town the size of Ithaca, like a, a rural kind of community, a community with a, a higher education place, or do you want to be in a more urban setting, a bigger city? Maybe you want more amenities that a bigger city offers. So it has to be again relevant to you. So you know these things are all things that we have to think about. Okay. So I told you that we had um, done a survey with, uh, with a lot of people, and we got some, uh, some interesting feedback from them about some techniques for setting and achieving your goals. One, the first one was timing your planning. So for some people, it's really hard to go cold turkey right into retirement. So some people like to take their time, and maybe, like Cornell has the phased retirement, so some people slowly uh, spend a couple of years moving into retirement. So you can go part-time and that's actually a good bridge or find another part-time opportunity, you know, have another job lined up when you leave the job you have because that gives you a bridge so you're not going cold turkey straight into retirement. Another thing you can do is start some activities before you retire. So Kathy said, you know, she was interested in, in watercolor. Well, if you start doing that before you retire, when you go into retirement, you've already got somewhat of a, not a routine, but I mean, you've got something that you're not just waking up in the morning and saying, well, what do I do next? You know, um, you've already got something that, you, that you've started doing. You can also hit the pause button, which means you don't have to wake up tomorrow and take this handout we gave you if you're retiring tomorrow and say, okay, I've got to like have all my goals and like, oh my gosh, you know, I've got to be volunteering in two weeks. You can just say, you know something, for the next four months, I want to sit on the beach and drink my rum and watch the sunset. You know, so you, can, you should take time and really, these aren't things you necessarily come up with overnight. So take your time, be deliberate, think about what it is you want to do. It doesn't happen to tomorrow. And again, these are hard and fast goals. Uh, a feedback we got, which we both also, priorities. So, um, this woman here spoke about, you know, family was a priority and now she's got more freedom and so being happy is a priority. So often we'll have multiple priorities in retirement, right? Well, there's many things we want to do. We want to travel. We want to take a class. We want to volunteer. Um, so you want to prioritize what's most important to you. I had said that I wanted to work with people and I really liked working with people. And I had an opportunity a couple of years ago to actually work as a docent at the Johnson Art Museum. And it sounded like a great opportunity. I love art history. It sounded really good. But you had to go through eight weeks of docent training every Wednesday. And it was only offered in the fall. And at the same time, I had already started planning a trip to Italy. I really, it was a lifelong goal to get to Italy. I'd never been there. And I really had to step back and say, okay, these are two goals that you want to hit, which is in this moment, in this minute in time, because as you said, your priorities change, what was my highest priority? You know, and I decided to do the travel instead. So you want to set your priorities. And then additional goals are just things like go slow. Uh, we have a tendency to want to do everything at once. The minute we retire, we've got 10 goals. We want to hit all of those at once. You don't have to. You should just kind of ease your way into what it is you want to do. Um, if your goal is to learn social media, um, you don't have to learn Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat, you know, just learn one thing, go start slow. A couple of other ones, write your goals down. It's a proven fact, if you put it down on paper, it's more likely to happen. So make a list, write it down. And also share your goals with other people, same thing. If people, if you share your goals, then people, it's more likely to happen. All right, so the um, last thing I want to talk about is the flexible planning that we mentioned earlier about things change. So it really is important that you develop a flexible plan because your interests do change, your priorities do change, and sometimes life happens that you're not expecting. So um, if you had as a life goal, perhaps, a retirement goal, that you were going to, going back to Italy again, you were going to spend six months in Italy, you were going to learn the language, and you, and you went through all your SMART goals. You had it all set up. You found the apartment in Italy. You knew you could financially afford it. You timed it out. You got a house sitter for your house. Everything was in place. You're ready to go. It looks perfect on paper. And then a family member becomes very ill, and you're faced with an elder care issue, and you're the only caregiver. So now that goal is off the table, right? Well, it doesn't have to be totally off the table. It can be deferred. Or you can say, okay, I know that now this really isn't going to be realistic for the next X number of years. 
but I still really want to learn Italian. You can go on Skype and find an Italian tutor. And you can just weekly meet with your Italian tutor on Skype. Well, you're still doing that caregiving and still doing that other stuff. So you're still meeting part of that goal. You haven't totally given up your goal. So it's important to be to plan for the unexpected. And we know that too from our financial planning and retirement. And to have those backup plans. Those things are really important. Okay, back to you. The widget. Um, we have the uh, resources list in the handout, but also on the front page and maybe on the top of that resources list. If you send an email to our email address, we'll send you an electronic copy of that resources list. You don't have to type in the URLs. You can just click on them and get through to them. So we have those. Um, what we'll probably be doing is not, you know, that that print resource list will get updated every once in a while, but the new stuff will be coming through on the Facebook. And we're just finding interesting articles talking about all of these different things that we've been talking about here. And if, if, uh, if you're not on Facebook? If you're not on Facebook and you have no desire to be on Facebook, <laughs> um, you'll you have our email. So, you know, if you'd like, you can email us and say, please keep me up to date. If you're putting, if you're posting articles, I'm not on Facebook, can you send me a link to that article? And we can keep a little mail list that way as well. So you can still get these resources without necessarily going to Facebook. That's actually one of my goals in retirement is to stay at least somewhat up to date with all of the new things. And it helps to have a niece who's very into all of this. So, um, so we have that resources page and the, the sort of summary thing is we heard from one friend who said to us, I'm not going to retire, I'm going to rewire. And I really liked that philosophy that this is the next phase, this is your third act or this is your encore. It's, it's described various ways because depending on your longevity, my parents lived to 90 and 94. So I'm looking at a nice chunk of time potentially almost a third of my life, which is a marvelous thing to be able to control. Um, so our hope is that we've possibly given you a little bit of a process or some ideas on how you could make your, your third act a little more meaningful or thought through so that you don't feel like you're floundering. So with that, we're gonna end the presentation and ask, um, oh yes, oh, resources sheet. Yeah, I got that one. Questions and comments. So yeah, are there comments that you have for us? Was this useful for you? What else could we add to it? Anything? Yes. Excellent. Yes, adding spontaneity to this, remaining open all the time. Don't let the fact that, oh, well, this isn't on my goals list. Don't let that stop you from bringing in something that just happens. Yes. Other, other comments? Anything from the remote use, the folks coming in? Okay. Questions? General, general comments, because you have an opportunity. Yes. Yeah. 
Ja. Mm -hmm. So it's really this idea that through trial and error and through the processes and the deliberations you make, you forge your identity all the time. And the identity is changing over the years. Okay. Yes. So, so the question is, you know, is it is it better to have a little bit of structure for the first you know, the waking up the day after retirement um, when you, you've lost your existing routine. <laughs> um, personally, I, I mean, I think it's, it's partially down to your personality. But yeah, I think it does help to have a, a, at least an idea of what it is you want to aim for. It doesn't mean that when you wake up on that first day of retirement, you have to necessarily do that thing. You know, we hear a lot of people say, and I think it was my experience too, when I first retired, it, I didn't feel like I was retired because for the first two weeks or so, you feel like you're on vacation. It's just, I'm just on vacation. I'm going to go back, you know. Um, and, and there's also what I found was the day I walked out of my first retirement, which was my big retirement from the director's position. The last day, I, it felt like an out-of-body experience. As much as I was looking forward to it and knew I wanted to do something different and had actually planned six months ahead of time that this is when I was going to retire, um, it was just the weirdest experience to walk away. And when I woke up, it was great not to set that alarm. And it was great to have all day to do what I wanted. But I think if I hadn't had some kind of plan, you know, after a, after a few weeks of that, it does get a little bit boring. You know, I mean, it's like, well, what do I do all day? Uh, you know, you can only shop so much and read so much and sit in the sun so much. You know, you, you need to do something. You want to keep doing something. So I think, yeah, you don't necessarily have to start whatever it was you planned the day you wake up the first day of retirement. But having some concept of what do I want to do in the next six months? And maybe that first month is doing nothing. You know, maybe it's just kind of laying around and reading and, uh, but yeah, you, I think it helps personally. I don't know what you think. And, and since, yeah, since we're very complimentary on this, I'm the putterer and dabbler. My plan waking up after, you know, the first day of retirement was I didn't make any plans for six months. I gave myself six months to just, well, talk about shopping. I bought an inordinate amount of art supplies in those first six months. But yeah, that was, you know, that was my plan. But it was definitely, I was going to relax and just see what started to bubble up. And, and actually the reason we got into all of this was because after those six months and a little after that, I was talking with friends and said, you know, I finally had to write a goals list, just like I used to do at work with my goals and accomplishments. And a friend said, you need a retirement supervisor to make sure you achieve those. And that's where the germ of this idea of I was using my work process, applying it to my retirement life, and it's turned out to work out pretty well. Yeah. Other, other comments? Yes. started on whatever activity it might be that I want to do because I get home and I'm tired and I just want to, you know, have dinner and basically veg out for the day. <laughs> and, you know, try to do a little bit of fighting if I work a pair of pants to make up a big deal. Um, and, you know, weekends, you know, we get kind of everything we can press this weekend. But, you know, if what I think I want to do is go volunteer somewhere, I don't feel like I have time now to to get it started. Yeah, and um, this, the, the challenge of trying to plan your retirement while you're still working full time, if you're lucky or if that's the sort of thing you can do, you do it, but if you can't, that's maybe the first thing on your list for when I retire is to just start trying to plan for my retirement. Because, yeah, especially well, when you yeah. get older, you get more tired. You can't do as much. And, and it, 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 it also comes back to that there's no ironclad right or wrong way to do this. Often people find having that bridge is a good thing. But as you say, I mean, I feel 
you know, I totally hear you and I'm only teaching online and volunteering, you know, in the evening right now, I'm kind of exhausted. You know, it's like, yeah, okay. I, I just want to watch some junkie TV or, you know, read or something. So you don't have to necessarily have that bridge. You don't have to start the volunteering before you retire. If you know that's something you're interested in, you can keep it in the back of your mind. Again, you vaguely start thinking about it, but it's not mandatory that you have a bridge into retirement. It's just some people like to do that. But yeah, there's no right or wrong. Yes. Uh, I have a working spouse, so I feel so uh, jaded when I have to go to work with someone back porch, or then I think I work in the garden. Lunch, and he comes home, you know, he got up early, he exercised, he went to work, he got a meeting tonight. And then he comes home and makes up in the kitchen. <laughs> hey, you've got a good deal. <laughs> I, do, I have a very good deal. But yeah. I have to say, for a long time, you know, I could have just left this for a long time. I worked full time, right. I with the kids, I did the, the side right. thing. Right. And people would say, well, you must be very high energy. And I would say, no, I'm just exhausted all the time. Yeah. And I was, you know, mm -hmm. so <laughs> I'm shaking off the guilt. You're shaking, well, yeah. So the, so the, the comment for those of you and online, I, yeah. Good, that's, yeah, exactly. So, so the comment for those of you online was, you know, I, the, the commenter was saying, oh, I feel a little guilty, you know, it's like my husband's still working for time, full time and I'm like sitting on the back porch reading my book and, you know, doing my thing. But yeah, you should not feel guilt. And that's a, that's a hard, again, it's hard to kind of shake off that guilt. It's true, especially if you have a spouse or partner who's still working, you know, you might feel a little guilty, but you know, you earned your retirement. You worked hard, you earned to the right to take care of yourself. Um, and if you're someone, especially if you're someone who is a kind of a type A personality or someone who's always go, 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 um, like me, um, uh, I'm really bad at like saying no to stuff and just kind of, cause I do feel guilty. I'm like, Oh, I could do it. I could do that. You know? In fact, it's funny when, when I went back to Cornell the second time, uh, retirement, this was actually funny. So Kathy and I were colleagues the first time around. And when I went back for this grant funded position, Kathy was my boss, which was really kind of interesting okay. to start with. I'm paying well. Yeah. But, but so, and I had to have an evaluation, my yearly evaluation, which again was weird because, you know, so she does the evaluation and you had to fill out those, what are your goals, right? What are your goals for the next year? What were your goals for the last year? Did you meet your goals? And then you discuss it. So as a joke, I put, what was my goal? My goal was to retire. Did you achieve it? No, <laughs> you know, because I was back in 10 months. So... <laughs> so yeah, we're both thinking the same thing, but no, you, you shouldn't, it, it can be hard. And, and, and especially if you retire a little young, you know, if you're not like 70 or something, people are going, what, you're retiring already? What are you going to do with yourself? Well, you know, you worked hard, you earned it. Don't yeah. Shake off the guilt. And yes, convince your spouse that maybe you want to slow down a little. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. That is perfect. I love that. So yeah, lazy. Yeah. So laziness is not a bad thing. Laziness is not a bad thing. Yeah. There's act. There's. There's actually a. There's actually an organization in England, uh, based in London, called the Idler Academy, and their whole philosophy is how to be more idle. You know, how to be in the moment, like you said, find that joy, whatever it is, and not feel guilty about the fact that, uh, you know, think about when you were a kid, I could spend on a summer's afternoon, the entire afternoon, just, I can fall into a book and like lose my, 
don't even know what's around me and spend like hours just reading and being transported to another place. When we grow up, we're almost discouraged from that. You know, it's almost like, how could you sit there and read all afternoon? The laundry needs to be done and the garden needs to be weed and you should be doing this. You know, and I, and I think this is the perfect opportunity at this time of our lives to re- Find some of that childhood uh, idleness that, that, that just re relaxing. Yeah, returning. Absolutely. That's exactly what this whole session has been about, how to do that. Yeah. So it's a full circle thing. Yes, you see a full circle through. Anybody else? Any other comments? Or Well, you guys have been great. Thank you for all the comments. We got at least two people here. We're going to take on the road with us. <laughs> oh, we got one in the back. Martha, did you have a? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming.